Welcome to Life Stories with me, Des Tong. Now, my guest this week is by many regarded as one of the true local legends in music. Welcome, Raymond Froggitt. Thanks very much, Des. How are you? I'm good. I'm well, good. Well, our paths have crossed many times in your plane. Yeah. Uh, some odd places that we've worked together, I think. <laughs> you know, the Golden Diamond and yeah, uh, yeah, all them many Nashville. years ago. Yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. also uh, a, a guy that you used to have in your band, sadly no longer with us, Billy Paul. Yeah, lovely Billy. He was, uh, everybody will know Billy. I mean, he could play any kind of music. Yeah. He had a great love for it. Yeah, lovely And he was, uh, his input to whatever he was doing was total, yeah. 100%. That's why I love Billy for that. Yeah. And uh, apart from that, he was a, just a joyful human being. Yeah. Lovely man. So, life stories, let's go right back to the beginning. Wow. Yeah. I have a <laughs> good you memory. Remember that far? <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah. So, you were born in Birmingham. Yeah, that's right. And, um, and y you had an illness when you were young. I did, yeah. Well, when, when I was two years old, I got tuberculosis, which is, well, it's serious now, but it was really serious then. Yeah. Because there wasn't any streptomycin or any kind of cure, apart from rest, bed rest and stuff like that. So I went to the hospital when I was two and came out when I was seven. So that was such a long wow, term. that's a long time. Yeah, and, and really that was, if you managed to do that with that illness, you made it really, yeah. because most people died of it. Yeah. So it, it, it was just one of those, uh, one of those things that, I often, when I first came out of the hospital then, I went home, I didn't know what the house was because I thought it was a little hospital, you know. <laughs> I thought everybody in the world was a nurse, you know. <laughs> Guy had, had no idea of anything. And, yeah. and I suppose really, in a certain way, it probably put me in, the, in, in a good stead for travelling in our business because I've, I've never really thought of anywhere as, uh, as being home. Right. You know. So it was just, uh, just natural for me to just travel around. What made you get into doing what you do? What was, well, the, what was the trigger? Well, I, I got a job, uh, sheet metal working, travelling, you know, with the power stations and places like that, when I was a youngster from uh, 17 years old. And when I was 19, the tuberculosis reoccurred in, in the, my kidneys. That happens with tuberculosis. Mm. But you have to have it, you know, in your lungs first before mm. you get anywhere else. But it can attack any part of your body, you know. And so I had that occur when I was 19. So that really put pay to my job as a, a sheet metal worker on scaffoldings mm. and all that sort of thing. Mm. And so I always fancied myself as a bit of a singer, you know. When I'd get up in a pub, you know, at the drop of an hat and everybody in, walk out. In fact, <laughs> your first performance, yeah. I've got it here, was the Dunlop Social Club. I was eight years old. And uh, uh, my stepfather worked there at the Dunlop, and it was the Christmas do. And uh, there must have been 2,000 people in this huge canteen there. And something happened. Somebody didn't turn up a clown or something. And so they asked one or two kids to get up and do a thing. And I got up and done uh, Giri Giri Awesome Pef and Baston Ellen Boga by the sea or something. And they gave me sixpence. Cool. So that was my first. Uh, Fantastic. Well, that must have been a good bit of money when I was eight years old. Did you pay an agency fee on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I was resented paying that anyway, even now. <laughs> even now. <laughs> so, yeah. what, so, what got you then into yeah. writing your own material? Because I've talked yeah. to people about this before. Yeah. Like Colin Blunston was saying that he, did, yeah. he never realised the importance of writing your own material That's until right. later on. Well, no, nobody does, you know. I mean, in our business, we, we meet was complete accident. Uh, we, were, we were doing uh, ordinary chart stuff, you know, when you first start. Yeah. It was only kids. And uh, we got a, a recording contract with Polydor Records. And they'd only just started up in this country. There was, Though there was a huge, massive firm, mm. we'd never heard of them. Mm. We wanted to be on Decker or Parlophone, yeah, somebody yeah, we'd heard yeah, of. Yeah. So when we, we did get uh, summoned up by them, and we were a little bit disappointed because we, we wanted to be with a bigger, we thought, bigger label. We didn't know about billboard magazines and all of the, mm. you know, we had no idea about that. But, uh, and you were saying that the Bee Gees were, yeah, were at the same just, time as you? Yeah, they'd just come up from Australia and they'd... Uh, with their dad, and the, the, they came into Polydor. 
and the, they got signed up, but they were writing at the time. Right. So, uh, and they wrote me a couple of songs, you know, which I always say, and I did always joke with them, they were the worst songs ever wrote in the <laughs> entire life. But, but we was the opposition, you know, so I understand that now. But uh, they were great people, you know, very, very talented. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and to write your own things, the importance of that comes to you, you know, after a while, the penny drops. You think, well, you're searching around for good songs, and they're always going to get to established artists, you mm. know, you know, people like Cliff and people like that. Yeah. So I thought, well, we have to write some of our own, and we, and we, we got a job over in the south of France in Nice at, at the Whiskey Club, and we were there for eight weeks, six hours a night, you know. So there weren't enough songs in the world to do that, you know. <laughs> yeah. So. We started writing songs and uh, just to fill in the gaps, really. Right. And then when you start writing songs and you have a band to play on, the bug gets you because all of a sudden you're hearing your words and your yeah. music yeah. going somewhere. Yeah. Uh, even though it's not very far, you, you can hear it being played. And I mean, it, must, it can't be anything more disappointing than being a songwriter in your own room, sending tapes off to people and getting them back or whatever. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. it, but this way, you, you put in your music in the industry. And you yeah, your band at the time, you, uh, in fact, still with you is, is yeah. Hartley, isn't it? Hartley Kane. Yeah. H. H. Yeah. It was, uh, and our bass player was Louis Clark, who eventually ended up with ELO. Yeah. And uh, Len Ablethorpe, who eventually went with his family and lives over in Canada. But we still see Len. Right. Now and again, he was our drummer. And H was the guitar player. And that's the way we was for. I don't know, 100 years, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and just just making music. But we've always recorded from 1965 onwards. We've always been making albums. And we've made an album every year since then. Right. You know, and, and during those time, I know, you know, a lot of the musicians that, that have played with us, like Clem Clatsdy, you know, the uh, great drummer. Clem Coutini, uh, yeah. 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 And uh, for Hal okay, McNair. Clem, Clem was on last week. Yeah, oh, Which, he was. Yeah, he's looking, yeah. he's looking oh, well. He's great. I mean, he's yeah. retired now, but uh, yeah. I mean, God, he's played with he's played with everybody. Well, he, he everybody. was the number one, not only in the world. I mean, yeah. he could do yeah. anything. Yeah. You know, and his name is with drums. I should think more well known than. You know, yeah. anybody you could think of. So you, you were saying you were, you were over in uh, in Nice. Yeah. So that must have been pretty uh, pretty nice little gig Well, it there. was, but we only ended up there because we failed the uh, failed the audition to go to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody went to Germany. Yeah, didn't everybody yeah. went. So God knows what we must have said. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a fella in the in the auditions from France. He was a, a booker or something. Right. A Jean Bernard, a Jean Bernard, I think his name was. And you might have heard I of him. I do know the name, yeah. yes, because he he also um, had something to do with um, Marvin Gaye. Oh, well, there you are. We and a, and a friend people. of mine, I think, Sissy Stone, yeah. Worked, uh, yeah, Bernard, yeah. Yeah, he was quite all on the, uh, you know, the Nice Coast, the yes. Riviera, yeah. they call it. And uh, he offered us a, a thing over there. The, the money was OK, we were put up. He, like our room was like seven dwarfs, you know, rower beds. Like yeah. The, and, but we <laughs> was kids then. You yeah, know, you didn't mind, did you? Yeah, and we found a little cafe. And we had it owned by an American fella, and, and uh, we ate there every day. And we could drink anything we wanted to at this club, though none of us drank. Only Louis, Louis Clark, looked a bit of a tot. Right. But uh, none of the rest of us did. And so uh, we, that sort of thing. It didn't bother us too much. But it was hard work. We did six hours of noise. Yeah. And on Sundays, we did five hours in the day and then another six hours on the noise. So the, so it was a good working area so for the band. So you were tight by the time you came yeah. back. You were pretty tight. Well, I mean, we were, we were as good as we could have been at that time of our, mm. of our development as yeah. musicians, you know. Yeah. And apart from that, we were, we were beginning to enjoy playing our own songs, which was more important than we thought it was. Yeah. So as, as soon as that we got signed up, uh, writing songs had now the confidence to give it to a, a proper professional producer and say, this is, we've written this. 
And uh, I was saying to him one day, the red balloon, and uh, he said that's a world hit. And it was. Which when which yeah, was Dave yeah, Clark 5. Yeah. In the Dave Club Five, they did, of course, uh, it was uh, sold four million copies in a day. You know, mm. then he was as the big as, as he could be. Yeah. And because of that, he was recorded by all manner of people that me and you have never heard of. You know, in different countries. Uh, I'm going to stop you there countries. because we're going to go for a break, and afterwards okay. we're going to talk about your songwriting. Okay. Back soon. Welcome back to Life Stories with me, Des Tong, and my guest this week is Raymond Froggett. Okay, Des. Now, before the break, we just started talking about the yeah. fact that one of your songs had been covered by the Dave Clark Five. That's right, yeah. How That's did that feel? Lucky. Well, it was luck, wasn't it? And actually, how we got the song was luck as well, because uh, I later met David, and he, said he was driving home in his car about two o'clock in the morning and somebody, a DJ played our version of it. Right. And he loved it. So he got in touch with the publishers and said, would he, I wonder if he did it. Right. Well, you know, we have to think about it. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's the sort of luck you get in our business, yes. isn't it, Des, yes, you know yes, yes. I mean? How lucky could you get? Because me getting a song to Dave Clark Five would be as remote as landing on the moon, you yeah. know, if, being who I was. But just by him listening to the radio going on that night, yeah, uh, the song became a world hit. Fantastic, that amazing. Isn't it? That, that's how a fantastic our business is. And then you went on. Uh, you went on Sir Cliffness. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, then, I mean, when when that happened with Dave, I mean, a lot of doors opened for you. Yeah. you know, publishing yeah. doors, and I signed up with. Uh, with Edwin H. Morris, they were uh, they were a Canadian firm, but not a big publishing firm, but a one man right. affair. And he sold up eventually to Chapel's Music. Yeah. So then I was becoming in a bigger organisation, yeah, yeah. and they wanted to keep the catalogue because of the success with the Dave Glove Five. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I was having little bits of luck along the way, and mm. I had nothing to do with it. You know, it was just uh, just gambling along, and. Uh, my publisher asked me if I would write a song for Lulu for the Eurovision Song Contest. Well, I didn't know what that was, you know, but, uh, or, or how you went about it, I would have a clue. But I knew Lulu, so yeah. I knew, it, you know, and, and the Eurovision Song because it bumped, it bumped, it started stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote a song called Big Ship, and uh, Mickey Most was uh, Lulu's manager at the time. And the BBC, it was in the time before people voted, you know, there mm. was a panel of people on the BBC. Right, yes. Yeah. And they chose it. And they turned my song down. Well, Mickey Mouse was devastated because he thought it was the best song of, of all for Lulu, for the Universal Song Contest. So he was that devastated by it. He took, he took the song to Cliff. Not Sir Cliff then, it was only Cliff yeah, in the yeah. day. And uh, yeah, he loved the song. And he recorded it and it sold, I don't know, four or five million copies worldwide. Yeah. And in all, every different country where Cliff is famous. Yeah. And all of the, the Cliff impersonators, which you know, Chinese yeah. people, <laughs> who were big stars in their own country, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they were doing it. So the song was growing without my that's, knowledge. That's I, fantastic. I didn't know anything about yeah. the music industry. So, uh, all of a sudden, then Cliff rang me up and said, would you write a few songs for me? I'm making a new album uh, with this new Australian um, uh, producer, director fella. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll do that. So I, I wrote for him after that for 10 years, you know. Right. And that, that was a, and in the meantime, I could do other things as well. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah. Well, I, I mean, I noticed Gladys Knight. Yeah, I oh, do uh, some songs for Gladys, uh, which is fantastic. I mean, when I think now, I, I, I didn't treat it as being, I mean, to me, I, it was, she was just a great singer. Yeah. And I never, you don't imagine what kind of credibility you can get within the business because oh, of absolutely, that. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I had yeah. no idea of it. So that, in America, doors was opening for me, you know, in uh, 
in Hollywood with ABC Music and uh, and Warner Brothers, Warner Reprise. Right. They they signed me up all all on the, the strength of, of the, the songs being covered by these great stars. Yeah. You know, and Joan Baez was doing the song and mine, and all of a sudden I I was kind of established as being proper. Yeah. Proper writer. And you got into the countryside of it as well, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I did. That was uh, through my own performances, really. Mm. Because we, as we were, were getting on, we was with Don Arden, you know, uh, yeah. Sharon Osbourne's dad. Yes, yeah. He was our, our manager. He, as he managed lots of Birmingham bands. Mm. And uh, he, he didn't know what to do with me as an artist, you know. Uh, so he, he just approached uh, Mervyn Conn, who was the... the I suppose the virtuoso country uh, bringer over of American music to him. Yeah, yeah. And they did a deal, and he sold me. To, <laughs> you know, like, like, a, like a piece of cattle. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I ended up in this thing, but I was able to. But Don uh, allowed me to go over to uh, Memphis to Midnight House Studios. I made an album there with uh, Isaac Hayes Band. Right. And you know the Blues Brothers film. Yeah. That, that band in there, Steve Cropper and right. Doctor. Wow, really? All them. I made an album with them, in the, and you asked me, you know, our moments before filming, that uh, whether I played the guitar. Well, I had to play guitar <laughs> in front of them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every one of them. If you could play the guitar, great. You'd feel yeah. ordinary yeah. in that that yeah, company. Yeah. But uh, me and H was there in Midnight Air Studios with uh, Michael Tolls and uh, Doctor Don. Steve Cropper, yeah. uh, Willie Hall on the drums, God's, and God's Lester the, Snell, uh, that size all music, these magnificent they? people. Yeah. Yeah. And I had to play a song to them <laughs> with my, my <laughs> method. And one of them said he uses the claw method. <laughs> well, I'm home and dry because they, yeah. they ain't bothered. They yeah. can just laugh at it. But we made a great album there with them, you know, which was... Uh, we used Memphis horns, you know. Yeah. And I, I remember I, I did a song there called Let the Moon Shine on Me, and it was kind of a gospel song. And uh, Steve Popper went out into ordinary shops, you know, and I, all of, he came back with a lot of women, old women with the shopping bags and that. They were the, the church oh, choir the choir, of Memphis. Fantastic. So there was all shopping bags in this <laughs> line, and all the old girls with the, the coats on it going, and they sang, let the moon shine. Wow. Let the moon shine on me. Let the big river roll to the sea. Let the moon shine on me. It was them black ladies. Yeah, beautiful. And a beautiful sound, you know. Fantastic. Going. And I thought, God, this is, you, you couldn't do that in England. Yeah. You, it would have been impossible yeah. to do. And then they sang that that song and it sounded, I thought, I didn't write this. <laughs> you know, this was, you know, this was just uh, let the moon shine. Yeah. Be a big, when them ladies have seen it, Beautiful. it was fantastic. Just you know. to ask you quickly, um, yeah. the ship and rainbow in Dudley oh, Road's yeah. got a big sort of part of you, hasn't it? Well, it has. Um, but Wolverhampton, really, was the very first time we ever got any kind of response to our band outside of our own town. So, uh, and we got a, a wonderful gathering there, uh, which still remain today, all, mm. all of them and they died. Mm. But uh, I did a thing at the Robin 2 uh, recently and there was loads and loads of people there. There were children of the mm, yeah, of the original. Yeah, that's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. And they were, they were saying to me, we were brought up on your music. Your, your dad yeah. was always playing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mom always loved this. And, and, uh, you know, that's that's how wonderful our business is, isn't it? It you is, know, yeah. You yeah. know, when you, you touch the... So it become really part of people's families. Yeah. And, uh, and part of their culture and their own... I mean, I get people now saying, we played so-and-so at, at our mum's funeral, you know. And I think, well, that's, that's a pretty nice thing to happen to your song, isn't it? That people feel that good about it, that yeah. they can 
say goodbye to somebody with it, you know. And it's lovely when, when people, when you play it, and people all sing the words for you oh, as well. Yeah. <laughs> and they actually, they remember them better than me. <laughs> so, so, it was that long ago, I can't even remember. I had to make them up as I go along, you know. <laughs> Get but, into trouble doing that, because they all sing they the all, words and they, they tell you off. <laughs> they all know, eh? that's yeah. right. Yeah. What I'm going to do, Raymond, I'm going to play, yeah. uh, at the end of the show, we're just going to play a little bit of a, a video of you. OK. Um, and I want to say thank you so much for coming in. It's been, it's been, it's been brilliant. And um, long may it rain. Yeah, thanks very much, mate. Good luck to you. My pleasure. Yeah, nice to see you. So, I'm going to play a little bit of a video of Raymond out and join me again for another Life Stories. Neon lights go flashing high Across the city sky While my newly found companions Keep their sorrow in their Someone who needs someone, give me a call.